Welcome, everybody, and welcome especially to the Worshipful and the Mayor and Mayoress of Hillingdon, Councillor David Yarrow and Mrs. Rita Kilroy. Actually, I realise that potentially there may be something rather cruel and ironic about wishing you all a very warm welcome here tonight. It may be that if the gods have been differently disposed, you have not been here with us in the warm embrace of our cerebral stimulation, but rather in the impassioned grip of a known or perhaps unknown loved one. <laughs> if this is the case, uh, and we are definitely second choice, I am sorry. <laughs> but let me assure you that we have a great evening ahead of us. Of course, this is not the only possible scenario. You may have brought a partner with you for tonight's event as a warm-up for a romantic tryst later on. <laughs> or even more intriguingly, it could be that you are banking on meeting your Valentine somewhere in the audience tonight. <laughs> and yes, even though the spotlight's in my eye, I can see one or two furtive glances just checking out the chances. However, whatever option is yours, whether your heart is lonely, brimming, or hopeful, you really are most welcome. This public lecture series is a wonderful platform for demonstrating the essential academic mission, and tonight's lecture does exactly just this. Each of our speakers is driven by a desire to show us our world in ways that will surprise us, to reveal that things are different than we thought they were, to disrupt our commonplace understandings and indeed, even to make these understandings the very subject of analysis and consideration. This can be a testing and challenging experience. It can even make us feel a bit uncomfortable. And the theme of tonight's lecture, the dynamics of attraction, is most definitely one where knowledge can be a dangerous thing. For here we are, thinking that the most personal, the most identifying, the most essential of all our characteristics is our desire, who we are attracted to, and yet we're going to hear and learn that our desire does not stand alone in some idiosyncratic space, but rather we have to understand it in terms of our physiology, our culture, or through the narrative frameworks in which we are all immersed. What we're about to hear opens up the very disturbing possibility that our desire is in fact not strictly ours at all. Wow. That's something to get your head round. Such revelations are tantamount to a loss of innocence and everyone here will have experienced such losses in their lives. Mine came with the voluptuous beauties of Peter Paul Rubens and the, and, and, and the statues, the male statues, in the National Museum of Athens. Rubens, graces, goddesses and nymphs are famous and iconic for the fullness of their figures and the generosity of their curves. In contrast, males in classic Greek statues are marked out, so to speak, by the perfection of their, their musculature and the diminutiveness of their private parts. <laughs> we know that the female form Rubin celebrated it so decorously is directly at odds with the ideal of womanhood that dominates the media and popular conception today. And I have to say that no young man I have ever encountered has coveted a small penis in order to enhance his attractiveness. <laughs> the traditional explanations here are that Rubens was merely reflecting the standard of beauty in the 17th century Flanders, whilst small genitalia was a symbol of status in American Greece. No, not American Greece, it's a Freudian slip. <laughs> in ancient Greece. <laughs> focus, focus. Um, <laughs> They're beyond, all done and dusted, finished completely, that's it, the explanation's done. Well, it is until we actually start to think about one or two other things. Like, firstly, as you'll see a bit later on, in fact, many of Rubin's most famous nudes were modelled on his second wife, whom he married when he was 53 and she was just 16. <laughs> it's going to be a long night. <laughs> um, also, that in fact, there was very little contemporary evidence that the good burghers of Antwerp in the mid-1600s actively preferred the bigger form. And also, the artistic inspiration for Rubin's models was not to be found in the studios of his native Flanders, but in the work of the very Italian Raphael and Titian a century or so previously. Likewise, what are we to think when it's pointed out that statues, uh, statues across the history of, of statuary in all Western cultures feature smaller-than-life-sized appendages? 
that also there's plenty of admiring references in classical Greek literature to the members of those who are very generously endowed. And also that small genitalia, far from being an indication of status, were in fact a symbol of youth and inexperience. So nothing is easy. The quest for knowledge and understanding is, is never completed. As soon as we have peeled off one skin of the onion, there are others that need to be removed. So with this in mind, let's begin tonight's journey of revelation. Our first speaker on the new dynamics of attraction is Dr. Michael Price. Originally from the United States, but not Greek. <laughs> Michael received his BA from Duke University and his PhD from the University of California, Santa Barbara. His doctoral research focused on evolutionary psychology and included field work conducted among Amazonian tribes in Venezuela and Ecuador. Before arriving at Brunel in 2006, Michael held postdoctoral positions at the Indiana University, Santa Fe Institute, and Washington University at San Luis. At Brunel, much of his research has focused on the psychological relevance of bodily shape. For example, on what kinds of bodily shape are perceived as most attractive, and on how one's muscularity and attractiveness affects one's personality. With his collaborator, Dr. Jin Sheng Kang of the, of the Brunel School of Engineering and Design, Michael makes heavy use of the school's 3D optical body scanner to collect the large amounts of anthropometric data that these studies require. As well as researching body shape, Michael also undertakes work on the relevance of evolutionary psychology for the financial services industry. He is recently a plenary speaker at the annual conference of the Financial Services Knowledge Transfer Network and writes a regular column for the leading banking magazine, Global Custodian. It is with my very great pleasure to present to you Dr. Michael Price. <laughs> 